This is a Pasco Media production. Please visit pascomedia.com. In Latin, renovo means to renew, restore, or revive. This is the show where we explore the miraculous nature of the mundane as we look at one part of the Catholic tradition to help you engage more fully in the practice of of faith. Past episodes are available at RenovoPodcast.com. I am Doug Tuke, and today we take a look at probably my favorite gospel passage, if you can have such a thing. And the reason is, if you know me, if you've ever seen me speak, if I've ever done any kind of training or in-service near or around you, uh, very rarely will I not mention this passage, the road to Emmaus, Luke 24. Uh, I the, And the reason is because It just frames so much of the mission. Uh, When our bishops constructed Renewing the Vision in the late 90s, that really kind of gave us literally the framework for how to do youth ministry. They used the road to Emmaus to describe that. And I've been so steeped in youth ministry for so long. The narrative is just really like informed a lot of what, um, just, just who I am as a person. So in the Easter season, in the road, the time of the road, when the readings are read and the narrative is explained, I thought, man, we got to do a show on this. This is the goods. So I want to dig into it. If you have not ever read any uh, Ronald Rollheiser, Father Ronald Rollheiser, he's a missionary oblate of Mary Immaculate. If you've never read any of him, you're missing out. He has a whole series of prose, but he has one beautiful, he has a lot of books, but he has one beautiful little story about the road. And I want to read you the introduction to this because I think it just sets the stage for exactly what we're going to talk about. He says this, he writes, in 1984, he wrote this. Nearly 2,000 years ago, two disillusioned youths consoled each other as they walked that seven-mile stretch of road separating Jerusalem from Emmaus. They moved slowly, depression having taken the spring from their steps. A double feeling clung to their hearts that day. They were hurting, and there was a reason. Their Messiah and their dreams had just been crucified. A deep, dark disappointment dampened their spirits, and there was fear. Most of all, there was fear. Not fear that they themselves might be crucified. That prospect loomed more welcome than the thought of going on. Theirs was the more horrible horrible fear, the fear that comes from the realization that perhaps nothing makes a difference after all. Maybe our dreams and our hopes point to nothing more real than Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. Maybe hope is only for children and the naive. They had been so excited, so full of hope. The uncrucified Christ had filled them with a dream, with the dream, a dream that had come to as a new innocence, a fresh energy, a feeling absent since they had been children and which prior to meeting Jesus, they had long ago unconsciously despaired of ever feeling again. Wow. That'll set the stage. That's where we're at. It's the day. It's post Good Friday. It's still the Easter season. It's Easter morning, presumably in the narrative of Luke. It's this time when the women have waited at the tomb, but men and women who have sought Christ are disillusioned and walking away. Rollheiser also talked about in a lecture that I saw him give how archaeologists have dug up this presumed location that is Emmaus and found hot springs and brothels. They found it's basically this area where people would leave the city of truth to go and party. Basically Vegas. I know if you're from Vegas, I apologize, but come on, you have the strip. Don't kid yourself. Sin City, okay? So this idea that it was a place to get away from truth, that's the stage. That's the people. That's us. That's us wandering away in fear and disillusionment. So with that, let's get into it. Now, listen, of the stories unique to the Gospel of Luke, There actually probably isn't one more compelling than this one, okay? It's a microcosm of the church itself, and we'll talk more about that later on in the show. It is filled with a lot of imagery. It's totally pertinent, not only to Easter, but every day in the church's life. In fact, actually, scholars have suggested that this narrative, Road to Emmaus, is largely catechetical and liturgical in nature on purpose, which fits perfectly into this post-Easter context mystagogy, right? The deepening of one's appreciation and understanding of the faith. You guys kind of know the story, I think. It's pretty well known. It really just needs to be summarized. Two disciples discouraged after the crucifixion of Christ. They're leaving Jerusalem by the road leading to Emmaus. They're walking away from Jerusalem, away 
from truth. A stranger draws near and inquires about what they were discussing. The stranger, of course, is Jesus. But, quote, their eyes were prevented from recognizing him, which is an indication that God is acting pretty much behind the scenes for a much greater purpose. Okay, the divine passive, as we call it in writing. Okay, they recount the incredible tale of the resurrection story they had received from the women who had gone to the tomb of Jesus and they found it empty. Okay. Now the story goes, the stranger then remarks on their lack of comprehension and proceeds to interpret all the scriptures. It's the greatest Bible study in the history of Bible studies, people. Okay. He explains the necessity of the Messiah's suffering. And then they invite the stranger to stay with them for the night while at table in this very Eucharistic setting, they recognize that the stranger's true identity is of course, Christ. And then he vanishes from their sight. Then their final comment And actually, the kind of the action that provides the key interpretive clue is, quote, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us. And then the two, they returned to Jerusalem with this incredible tale of how they had come to know Christ, quote, in the breaking of the bread. That's the story. If you haven't read it, read it. If you haven't heard it at Mass, listen better, okay? Now, there's there's four really big details in the story. So if you reflect on it, here's the thing you're going to realize that it contains a lot of important aspects pertaining to the church's like ongoing life of faith, okay? We can only focus on four of them. We we just don't have time in this show. And also, I'm really passionate about this, and I'll go yappy, yappy too much. Uh, You know, we'll visit some, we'll hang out and Google chat, and we'll we'll have an extended conversation. But here's the thing, regarding kind of the liturgical year and, and who we are and what we're celebrating as church, let's talk about the four. The first one is this. Word and sacrament in the teaching. So here's the thing. The most obvious meaning of the story sent around uh, this kind of understanding of the disciples that it comes to them in two forms, okay? The scriptures and the Eucharist, right? Christ giving them an uber Bible study and then, of course, breaking the bread. Now, these two things are more essential to Catholic identity. and uh, There's nothing more essential, okay? These, these are them. This is the roots right here. We are, okay, by definition, as a community of faith, gathered around word and sacrament, which the Second Vatican Council described as, quote, the one table of the word of God and the body of Christ. We talked about that document in our Vatican II show. Word and sacrament are bound together intimately, not novelty, intimacy, okay? for the, Listen, they reveal God, okay, the revelation of God, and they reach out, they befriend humanity, they draw us into communion with one another and with God. That's just it. That's the bottom line. So in the Emmaus story, Christ's explanation of the scriptures is super prophetic, okay? Because he begins with Moses specifically and all the prophets and then proceeds to interpret all the scriptures for these two disillusioned disciples. But it's in the Eucharistic action that follows that when Christ repeats the gesture of the Last Supper, which he was present at, obviously, blessed, broke, gave the bread, okay, that their full recognition of the stranger arrives. So just when the bread is broken, their eyes were open, remember, right? Christ vanishes. Now note this kind of passive voice. God's grace ultimately allows these two to recognize the risen Jesus in the Eucharistic meal, but it's both in word and sacrament that fullness is revealed. That's a big deal, Catholics, especially when we're pastorally discussing how not all churches are the same, how not all worship is the same. In word and sacrament, there is a fullness known uniquely to Christ. Okay. That's a big deal. Okay. Let's talk about the road. The second feature in the story, it's it's super compelling as an image for the church specifically, because the story begins and ends with a journey on the road, right? We are a pilgrim people. That's us. All right. So listen, at first, the two disciples, one of whom is named and otherwise known or otherwise unknown. Okay. So Cleopas, they're leaving Jerusalem. We don't know what the names mean. They're also gender neutral. So this could be two youths, married couple, two men, two women. We have no idea. They're leaving. But after their recognition of the risen Christ in the word and sacraments, they head back to share their experience with the other disciples in the holy city of truth. Okay. Their conversation takes place though in root. Don't forget that. So their experience of the risen Christ takes place on a journey. And at first it's filled with a lot of disappointment and most likely fear, like, like Ronald Rollheiser talked about, but then concludes with another journey. Now they're filled this time with a desire 
to share this amazing experience. They become witnesses to Christ, the suffering Messiah. While on the road, they run back. They run back. Okay, now a distinctive feature um, of Lumen Gentium, the Second Vatican Council, okay, specifically, is the term pilgrim church. That's a big deal. Okay, so what is so startling is that it runs totally counter to this sort of like traditional understanding of church as an institution, immovable, unchangeable. That's not, that's not the beauty of this modern understanding. So a a pilgrim community that's always moving, always on a journey towards the kingdom of God, this is a summons, okay, to recognize that earth has limits. This is not the end. This place is not the end. At the same time, the idea of this image of a pilgrim church that comes from the Lord, it comes to us on the road. The revelation is we got to get on the road. So we have to go, which means Christ wants to accompany us, even when we don't recognize him, until that awesome, miraculous moment where we realize when the scriptures and the bread are both broken open, oh, this is the mission. Go make disciples of all nations. That's the church. That's who we are, the pilgrim people. Okay, now here's the other thing too. No one's alone. No one's alone in the story. So there's a big deal in the Emmaus story and to the disciples themselves specifically. A couple of scholars have actually kind of speculated that the two on the road, Cleopas and their companion, may have been married, which I love. And we talked about that briefly before. It's not impossible, okay, for the New Testament actually does mention quite a few married couples as disciples, okay? One of us, we think, obviously, I'm steeped in Paul, working for ODB Films, Paul the Apostle of Christ. We talk about Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, Romans 16, 1 Corinthians 16, who came from the church in Rome. It's also likely that uh, um, Andronicus and Junia, uh, who are called prominent among the apostles, were a married couple. That's in Romans 16. But the Lucan text does not actually give those details specifically to us on the road. It just remains pure speculation. But it's really cool to think about being paired in our discipleship. Okay, It's more important that they're together and that they are commiserating in their fear, in their sadness, and they're talking about their version of Christ. The reason is because their reaction, their bewilderment, okay, it's been shaped by the testimony of other disciples, other community, faith community has helped to dictate their understanding of Christ. The faithful women who had taken the news of the empty tomb to Peter and the others, that's in Luke 24, verse 10. So there's a network of discipleship. You're not called alone into the community of faith, but you are called with others. That's a big deal. Now, listen, in addition, the disciples, they share the story of Jesus of Nazareth together. They rejoice in the good times together. They commiserate in the bad times together. Listen, ultimately, they take refuge in this community of word and sacrament that preserves the faith of the apostles. Oh my gosh, don't get me started. Get your butt back to church community, get into community, meet with other couples, have a glass of wine, talk about Jesus. This is how the faith grows, people. This is why parish is the central unit of worship in the church. Don't give me this spiritual but not religious crap. We need to be in faith community. Okay, another topic, super important, the role of women and not to be dismissed. Father of five daughters here, people, you're going to get it right now. Okay. This is a big, big deal. This is a big aspect of St. Luke's beautiful inclusion of women. Okay. One of the most sensitive modern issues in the church revolves around the role of women. We've done a couple of shows on this in Renovo, right? Listen, the new Testament comes from an entirely different cultural context than our own. We all know that, right? But we have to be careful not to read into this biblical text too much. I, I I think the presence of women in the story is not insignificant. It's a big deal, given that Luke, right, of all the gospels, shows way more interest in including women in the stories about Christ. Mary, Anna, Elizabeth, the faithful women of Jerusalem, etc. Okay, But three major points stand out, all right? First, the fact that the women were the first to perceive the empty tomb is a big deal. They receive the angelic message of the resurrection and they recognize its significance in telling, okay? Now listen, their fidelity to Christ in his final agonies specifically, okay? That's noted by the women. When all the other disciples had fled, 
This speaks volumes about faithfulness, endurance, and the courage of these ladies. Look at Luke 23, okay? Look at Luke 24, 1 through 11, but look at Luke 23, 2. Secondly, the fact that their testimony after the resurrection was either not believed because it seemed like nonsense, Luke 24, verse 11, or was terribly puzzling, Luke 24, 22, is actually pretty indicative of the fact that they were crossing a lot of boundaries that some early Christians represented in the context of their times. So it was clearly controversial that it was coming from these ladies in the first place. Normally, the testimony of women was not admissible as real evidence in Jewish society. Consider that. Yet, early Christianity was founded on the basis of their testimony. I love that, the countercultural nature of of Christianity. Keep that in mind. Most scholars think Mary Magdalene, in fact, was the first recipient of the news of the resurrection. That's in the Gospel of John 11 through 18. It's an ancient tradition that calls her apostola apostolorum, the apostle to the apostles. Okay, good stuff. Listen, this narrative, this Lucan story, it's a microcosm of the church. Okay, it is. It's a micro. If you're just going to read one passage in scripture, Catholics, which you shouldn't, you should read tons more. But if you're just going to read one, you've got to read these. The four things we talked about in the show of the Maya story, they don't give us the whole picture, okay? But they do show us super essential aspects of the story. And they can they can easily um, defend the story as this beautiful image of the church in its total. Listen, in the midst of, of, uh, um, of uh, the Second Vatican Council, um, the year of faith, uh, who we are as a people, we got to take some time to reflect on this story. It is filled with with themes. And at the very least, we can say it shows what a community of disciples is, women and men on the road, ready to receive word and sacrament, always open to the surprising revelation that God sets forth through his son, Jesus Christ. That's a big deal. You know what I love? I love that Christ accompanies. He encounters on the road. First thing he says is, hey, what are you talking about? The two give their version of the story. They give their testimony. Christ listens. He listens to their testimony. And then Christ gives the greatest Bible study in the history of Bible studies while walking with the two away from truth, away from the city of light. He's not afraid to walk with you anywhere. Christ goes to hell. Listen to the creed. He's not afraid to go anywhere. He's Christ. So it doesn't matter where you're going. Christ is going to walk with you. No problem. And while walking testifies. And then, of course, gathers, peacefully gathers at the table. Peacefully gathers at the table and breaks bread. And, of course, that's the famous line. It's in the breaking of the bread that they came to see who he really was. And I love the reflection. I love that line. Weren't our hearts burning within us, as if to say all of us to say, oh, he was there all along. He walked with us all along. The journey was not just me, 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 me. It was being accompanied by Christ. And of course, we can never forget as Christ physically fades from the scene, the disciples don't mope around. They run back. They run back. Where do they run to? The upper room, right? We did a show on that. They run to the upper room, presumably the place of Thomas's doubt, presumably the place of Pentecost, presumably the place of the Last Supper, the gathering space that had become the disciples in terms of the birth of the church. They run back to truth. Friends, this story can be a supportive lesson for all of us who are parents that have had kids that have fallen away from the faith. It can be it can be an awesome source of support for us who have fallen away from the faith, who walk away from Christ's truth. But we can never dismiss the importance of pilgrim church. The church is moving, it's journeying, it's demanding hospitality. It's in need of pilgrims, those who want to walk with it. It does not preach a stagnant, dead gospel, but a living and breathing journey where encounter and accompaniment are very much at the center of its growth and its blessings. Woo! Luke 24, Road to Emmaus, don't get me started. Oh, you already did get me started. You just got 20 minutes of me getting started, for crying out loud. It's so good. Get in there and read it. When you hear it at Mass, celebrate it, make it a part of your life. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. All right, friends, don't forget to visit renovopodcast.com for past episodes. Please subscribe to, review, and rate our podcast. 
We always appreciate your input. Your topic suggestions, questions, and or comments are always welcome at Doug at RenewablePodcast.com. Learn more about me on Twitter and Instagram at D-T-O-O-K-E and the number one. Friends, always remember to engage the tradition and live the conversion. Until next time, God bless.